all the time. So <laughs> okay, good. I have to be gracious. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess my my main question is, um, if you had to de to define the my, the Mark Community Project, um, what are some like words that come to mind, and then sort of generally, how would you how would you describe it? Well, there's like if you think about like an article, like journal articles, and it says keywords, you know, when mm -hmm. you look up your mm -hmm. um, some of the things. Just I'll start with that is um, community art practice, revitalization, mm -hmm. reconciliation, rebuilding, memory, um, community university partnerships, um, relationships. Um, magic, <laughs> um, a lot of surprise, and um, exceeded expectations. That may really seem strange to people, but to me, every like what happened yesterday when we when I found the lots where Rosie works, which that she had created, it was like. I didn't know, I mean, I just, I've driven down that street, I had never seen it, and I felt like there's somebody here who's, like, we're not alone, and I keep finding people who have passion in them, and love for this town, and, and through many different ways, not just art, preserving history, um, gardening, whatever it is, and I keep getting surprised and I've been here for working for three and a half years my husband grew up was born and raised here during the era of segregation but every time I think I have a handle on it I realize I don't and this is a small town of 2200 people that has been left behind and people would overlook fairly easily it's like many other towns dying on the vine or just like it and what is so magical about it is that there's so much rich history there's so much talent there's so much resource and part of the issue is that people don't know it about themselves or their community they've they've um, capitulated to another version of themselves there's been disconnect in terms of the strength of their history. There's also a lot of pain around that history, so there's this kind of very much um, trepidation or resistance to going there. But I think what we've done with this project, like with this space or the Black History Exhibit or the Oral History Projects, is to bring people back to that those times knowing that every version of history is, is as important as the other, whether you think, you know, we're on this moral line or the other moral line, but that without, without all the lenses, with all, out all the experiences and stories, we don't really have a complete picture. And so I feel like a lot of the projects that we've worked on, like this space here, is a beloved space. Even during the time of segregation, and there were Thursday and Friday night games, there was Anderson High and Mark High, the people that played on Thursday night loved this field as much as the people that did on Friday night. And at this time, when there's a lot of hurt or unspoken feelings or reluctance to approach it, it's a way for people to come back to the space together and it, not address it in a confrontational way, but to acknowledge it and recognize everybody's experience around it but in a in a space that um, a site of memory that really people revere and is very beloved and we saw that on the uh, at the at the reunion during homecoming um, articulated by many people about you know black people who said they'd never been in a library before that day born and raised here um, a, a Mart High graduate of 1951 who played on this field and was interviewed and in, during that time said I used to come to the Thursday night games and um, I remember the way uh, 
Anderson High team would um, break their huddle and go in single formation past uh, their opponents, basically just do some smack talk. And he just kind of wistfully like, said, yeah, they were better players than us, and looked up at the sky and said, you know, I wish we could have played together. And yet I said, well, here, you reveal it. So while we've made some really, I think, monumental pieces around art, this this concession stand, the the, the, the facade on North Pearl Street, the mosaic at the high school, the classes, the workshops, the the exhibits. I mean, the the trips to UT from the Mark High students and vice versa. The, all the projects. But to me, what's really happened is the, to see the individual transformation of movement is, is remarkable. I mean, Rosie said she was going to park hide her car so I wouldn't come find her today. And like three or four hours later, she's still here painting on doors. It's like I'm persistent not because I'm just a pain, but because if I feel something, I'm going to act on it. And I knew that we were connected. And I realize that it can be totally overwhelming for this white woman, you know, um, who they don't know or some people know or know my family and think, this woman's crazy. But my craziness has kind of paid off. And it's not my craziness anymore. It's everybody's. It's everybody's passionate thing. And if it can happen here, in a place that's so left behind, it can happen anywhere leaving these vacant spaces, almost the vacancy of it is what invites the creativity. You go, I know of situations in East Austin where UT students go there and faculty go there and research this and it's just saturated and some people, they don't want to see another person for UT, they don't want to see them. It's like enough already, we're tired of you coming in and just kind of whatever and at the same time they're trying to do something so I'm not criticizing in that way. But in these vacant spaces, there's all this possibility because nobody cares anyway. He's been left behind. So the possibility to create is almost um, infinite because no one's been on, on the radar with it. And while I faced a lot of skepticism, a lot of skepticism when it moved from my family's art installation project to a community building process, there are people who, you know, come to me now and say, just yesterday, actually, the superintendent of the schools was saying, you know, I was, I told you up front I was really skeptical in the beginning, but what do we know? I was like, I'm willing to ride that out. You know, I don't take that stuff personally, and I completely understand it. Um, but I'm not going to let it stop me. And it, I haven't let it stop my students or my colleagues who come in. So sometimes I just don't know what to say because I I hear people talking about the Mark Project at UT and hear people on a national level or just sit back and like I did on Monday and see UT uh, Mark High students working with UT students in the design department and eating pizza together at the stadium. And I'm like, my lesson is not it's not so much like oh look what I did. My lesson is, if you have a vision, just follow it through, even if everybody tells you don't do it. If you believe in that vision, then you just go, you, you do it. You don't get discouraged. You don't get, um, you don't get discouraged. You get discouraged and then you just lick your wounds and say, you know, I have a passion, I have a vision, I have a feeling, and if I impart anything to my students or the people that I work with, it's be relentless, you know, and leave lots of room for magic, a lot of room for magic. So that's why the first, like, the key words that I gave you are all really entangled in this narrative that goes way back from when I met my husband in 1975 and he talked about this place, Mark. And the way he talked about it, while on one hand the racism really is so palpable, but on the other hand, it was an amazing, vibrant place um, where people cared about each other and had gardens and took care of their homes and 
worked the cotton fields and worked hard and worked at this factory or did whatever under very, particularly for the black community, under very, very repressive conditions, but still managed to have this like magical space. So when I came here for the first time in the early 2000s, it was like a, a shadow of its former self. Um, but on the other hand, I think you have to have the ability to see beauty in anything, and that's that repurposing piece. I've always been a person in my artwork who, re who repurposed, take things and make something from it. Old windows, old doors. I mean, I've been working on old windows and doors since like 1990, before they became, you know, little cool antique stores. And I love that concept of doors, door thresholds and doorways and going through to another side and taking something and using it metaphorically and symbolically and giving it a new iteration. And I think that's what we do as people and I think that's what this town is going through. A new a new iteration, a good iteration. And in, in any kind of growth, there's paint. That's why they call them growing paints. And there's people who resist and who are caught off guard and who the kids say are haters, but then there's people who just come out of what seems from nowhere, but they're not from nowhere, they're from here, and just join on, and, and, and have been, you know, movers and shakers, having Masan and Kenzie here this summer, and Heidi, and Anne, and the other students living here, they're able to build relationships, they're able to disarm people, they're able to engage people in creating, and as a faculty, particularly in the social work department as an artist and, and, and a, you know, in, in my discipline, there's a lot of talk around community engagement, there's a lot of talk around community engagement in, in the university setting these days because there's a need to be relevant because money is drying up and you have to justify yourselves. You have to make a contribution and it has to have real world application. And for me, there get to be a lot of buzzwords where people like, see, we did our community engagement. But community engagement is something that takes time, it takes building relationships, it takes those bumps in the road and saying, okay, I had a bump in the road. It takes working with students to say, okay, here's what you thought you were gonna do, but this is the way it turned out. So all that really to me mixes in.